but it illustrates that no matter what advantage you might think you have had in bondage, people desire to be free of bondage. They do not submit to it. We're going to talk pretty extensively tonight about Florida, who released a series of new guidelines for their social studies curriculum for pu the public education in Florida. Um, and it has some problems. Uh, so I kind of jumped around a bit, a bit about this and read through it a lot. And I decided to kind of approach this on two fronts. The first is I want to read to you some excerpts from some of Robert E. Lee's letters about slavery. And then I want to look into some of the resources the Library of Congress has put together on it. And we're going to look at that. And then finally, I want to look at the pertinent parts of the Florida document itself. And, and explain how this is designed around deceiving students um first of all through outright factual inaccuracies and secondly through the impression that is left by what information is presented and what information is omitted and this is gets to kind of the heart of how history is done if history was simply reading a primary source document and relaying that information back to an audience, it simply would be that any jackass could do that job. But that's not how this works. The system is designed around making judgment calls. You take in the data, you evaluate it, and you remember, especially when dealing with people who have existed that they bring with them all the baggage that we bring with us today so people misremember things they in high stress situations they simply input different data and exclude different data when to their memories than other people do um, they lie they they have agendas even historians who put together uh accounts include and omit information and those things are judgment calls so history is, is is always a process of revision because we are constantly going back over those things which we have done in the past and we are presenting them in new lights as new information comes forward this is not a bad thing this is how history is supposed to work we, we have to begin to understand that the past is not fixed and that it's not convenient. So Lee, Robert E. Lee is an interesting figure, I think, to take a look at this first, because Robert E. Lee epitomizes the narrative around slavery and the Civil War that has come up in America in the wake of the war. Robert E. Lee is known as a kindly gentleman. He is lionized in a way that's difficult to really justify. Oh. He's presented as a man who chooses his state over his country as a matter of conscience and not as an ideological believer of the confederacy and that's when people acknowledge that the confederacy was ideologically built on slavery at all robert e lee owned slaves or oversaw slaves for a significant portion of the period leading into the civil he was a situated gentleman in Virginia 
of class and status. His wife had slaves. He worked them difficultly into the bone. Um, in the period up to the Civil War, In 1856, Lee wrote his views on the institution of slavery to his wife. He described it as a moral and political evil. He, however, notes this is a greater evil to the white man than to the black race, and that the painful discipline they, the black race, are undergoing is necessary for their instruction as a race, and I hope will prepare and lead them to better things. He wrote that while we see the course of the final abolition of human slavery is onward and we give it the aid of our prayers and all justifiable means in our power, we must leave the progress as well as the result in his hands, his being God. This is, in and of itself, um, a contemptible quote by a contemptible man. Setting aside Robert E. Lee's performance as a military leader, which is also overrated, he, he is swept up in the racism of the times. He fully believes it. He sees the institution as necessary. And it's hard not to see his desire to see it ended as lip service. Um, he famously didn't really enjoy being a slave master. He thought it much too hard of work for far too little reward. Which is ironic in and of itself. He isn't a person who took a principal stand in the wait in the post war period. He's also not a person who advocates for Equality, particularly as the South descends into the barbarism of the KKK. There is no doubt by reading or listening to accounts of slavery, enslaved individuals, that they suffered immensely and did not see this as an advantageous state of affairs. And the. the <coughs> Come here, Bubba. You, everyone, people live in this house. Come here. Lay down. There's no doubt that he just, it, it, it's a horrendous institution that people did not see an advantage to. So here is... Uh, the Library of Congress keeps a list of primary sources and historical records available for teachers. Um, and I just thought we'd go through some of them before we get into this itself. This is a report created in 1865 by the occupying Union Army as they are getting the situation in control of and starting to evaluate the situations in the South after the Civil War. This particular report is created during an occupation of uh, the Gulf. When in April 1862, the guns of Farragut transferred the city of New Orleans from rebel to national rule, no such thing as a public school for colored children was found in the schedule of the conquest. No such thing had ever existed in the Crescent City. Even that portion of the colored population who, for generations, had been wealthy and free were allowed no public school, although taxed to support the school system of the city and the state. Occasionally, a small donation was made from the public fund to a school for orphans attached to colored orphans asylum. The children of free colored people who were in good circumstances known as Creoles, generally of French or Spanish extraction, when not educated abroad or at the north or from fairness of complexion by occasional admission to white schools, were quietly instructed at home in, or in a very few private schools of their class. Even these, although not contrary to law, were 
really the ban of opinion, but were tolerated because of the freedom, wealth, and respectability and light color of the parents, many of whom were nearly white and, and by blood, sympathy, and association. Slaveholding and other interests were allied to the white rather than the black. For the poor of the free colored people, there was no school. To teach a slave the dangerous art of reading and writing was a heinous offense. Having in the language of the statute, it's a law, a tendency to excite insubordination among the servile class and punishable by imprisonment at hard labor for not more than 21 years or by death at the discretion of the court. In the face of all obstacles, a few of the free colored people of the poorer class learned to read and write. Cases of like proficiency were found among slaves where some restless bondsman yearning for knowledge that he somehow coupled with liberty hid himself from public notice to con over in secret and laboriously the magic letters. In other cases, limited teaching of a slave was connived at by the master who might find it convenient for his servant to read. Occasionally the slave was instructed by some devout and sympathizing woman or generous man who secretly violated the law and resisted opinion for the sake of justice and humanity. A single attempt had been made to afford instruction through a school to the poor of the colored people by Mrs. Mary D. Bryce of Ohio, a student of Antioch College who, with her husband, both poor in money, came to New Orleans in December 1858 under a sense of duty to teach colored people. So many and great were the obstacles that Mrs. Bryce was unable to begin her school until September 1860. At that time, she opened a school for colored children and adults at the corner of Franklin and Perdidio Streets. The popular outcry obliged her to close the school in June 1861. Subsequent receiving, as she believed, the divine information that she would be sustained, Miss Bryce again opened her school in November the following year near the same place, afterwards removing it to Magnolia Street on account of room. Under Confederate rule, she was repeatedly warned to desist teaching. Emphasis to the majors. The gate posts in her front house were covered at night by placards threatening death to the, I'm not saying that word, teachers. When forced to suspend her school, Mrs. Bryce stole round at night, especially on dark and rainy nights, the more easily to elude observation to the houses or resorts of her pupils, and there taught the eager learners under every disability of mutual poverty, often of sore need in face of imprisonment, banishment, or possible death. Upon the occupation of our city, by, of the city by our forces, her school was preserved from further molestation, rather by the moral sentiment of the army than any direct action. For so timid or prejudiced were many of our commanders that long after the time General Emery sent for Reverend Thomas Conway to admonish him not to advocate publicly the opening of schools for colored children, as it would be very dangerous. The school of Mrs. Bryce continued to thrive and subsequently passed under the Board of Education, in whose employ she is now an efficient and honored principal. The advent of the Federal Army weakened slavery and suspended the pains and penalties of its bloody code, and few private teachers began to appear in response to the strong desire of colored people for instruction. No public schools were established until October 1863. The great work was thoroughly begun by the Commerce Commission of Enrollment created by the order of Major General Banks, commanding Department of the Gulf. In February 1864, the published General Order Number 23 of General Banks, the Miss Labor Order, that order bridged the chasm between old and new. By it, the laborer, although a slave, was permitted to choose his employer. The governing power was shifted from the planter to the provost marshal. In addition to food, clothing, quarters, fuel, medical attendance, and wages, instruction for his children was promised in the colored man by the government. It is scarcely possible to exaggerate the difficulties of establishing these schools in the county parishes. This would be the outlying counties of New Orleans. Considering the expense and probability of the change in the school districts, the board decided not to build schoolhouses at present, but to avail themselves of such accommodations as could be found. The parish provost marshals were directed to seize and turn over to the board all buildings designated by our agents as essential to the schools, taking care not to incommode or irritate anyone beyond the necessity of the case. Any hesitancy to act or indifference on the part of the marshals was forthwith met by the provost marshal general in the shape of a preemptory order or by prompt removal of the refractory subordinate. By this means, the first obstacles are overcome. 
Had the board received the same office of con a continuance of active interest in these schools manifested by General Bowen during his incumbencies, we should have had at this time at least 3,000 additional pupils. In some of the parishes, so great was the difficulty of obtaining boarding places for our teachers, notwithstanding the efforts of agents and provost marshals, that a special order or circular letter was published, by which many of the teachers were provided with temporary homes. But it frequently occurs that a desirable locality for school, it is impossible to obtain boarding for the teachers. In some cases, a weather poor proof shelter, very poor at best, is obtained and simple furniture provided, and a teacher sent who is willing to undergo the privations, often hardships, of boarding herself, in addition to fatigues of her school. Compelled to live on the coarsest diet of cornbread and bacon, often no tea, coffee, butter, eggs, or flour, separated by miles of bad roads from the nearest provision store. Refused credit because she is a Negro teacher and unable to pay cash because the government is unavoidably in arrears. Subject to the jeers and hatred of her neighbors and cut off from society with unfrequent and irregular mails, swamped in the mud, the school shed a drip and her quarters little better, raided occasionally by rebels, her school broken up and herself insulted, banished or run off to rebeldom. Under all this, it is really surprising how some of these brave women have managed to live, much more how they are able to render the service they do as teachers. Despite all the efforts of our agents and the assistance of provost marshals, the devotion of the teachers, many of these schools would be abandoned but for the freedmen themselves. These, fully alive to all that is being done for them, gratefully aid the teacher from their small store and mount guard against the enemies of the schools, whether he be rebel, a guerrilla, or a pro-slavery professed unionist skulking under beneath behind the oath. So this, I... I wanted to share this because the principal principal idea that is being fixated on is the one that f slavery was a boon to the enslaved in that it provided them skills. And it is not inaccurate to say that those who were enslaved were taught labors that were desired by the master. But they were not taught to them for their benefit. They were taught to them for the benefit of the slaveholder themselves. And you can see the contrast here. You can see the contrast in teaching someone to do a, a to labor in a field or perform maintenance in a, as a blacksmith, or to do these things. And you can see the particular contrast in what they don't want people to be taught under the slave codes. They do not want people to be taught how to read and how to write. They don't want education to spread because they believe that education will incite violence. And the entire idea behind the slavery and a not insignificant portion of the history of the South and their history during the Civil War is guarding against the prospect of uprising by slaves. There is a panic that is built into the slave codes that should they be given parity with the poor, they will overthrow people. <clears throat> and it gives lie to this concept that slavery is a boon. It gives lie to this concept that we that we created something better. Because the truth is, for a brief shining moment, for a brief shining moment after the Civil War, it very much looked like a significant amount of power was going to come to black Americans recently freed. They were winning elections. They were being elected as local and federal officials. And this galvanizes the Ku Klux Klan to strike back to try to preserve the South, the social order of the South. <clears throat> I'm not going to go over all of these. Uh, I, I do suggest you go look it up 
can read them. But I want to get to these tonight too. So. This is a piece from Savannah, Georgia. Transcribed uh, by Bryce M. Butler. The largest sale of human chattels that has been made in the Star Spangled America for several years took place on Wednesday. And Thursday of last week at the race course near the city of Savannah, Georgia. The lot consisted of 436 men, women, and children, and infants, being half of the Negro stock remaining at the old Major Butler plantations, which fell to one of the two heirs of that estate, Major Butler. Dying left the property valued at more than a million of dollars. The major part of which was invested in rice and cotton plantations, and the slaves thereon, all of which immense fortune descended to the two heirs, his sons, Mr. John Butler and Mr. Pierce Butler, still living and resident in the city of Philadelphia and the free state of Pennsylvania. We'll talk about that in certain, for certain. Losses in the great crash of 1857-58 and other exigencies of business have compelled the latter gentleman to realize and a southern investment said he may not satisfy his pressing creditors. This necessity led to a partition of the Negro stock on the Georgia plantations between himself and the representative of the other heir, the widow of the late John Butler. The Negroes were bought to the hammer last week of the property of Mr. Pierce Butler of Philadelphia and were in fact sold to pay his debts. The creditors, represented by General Cattawaller, while Mr. Butler was present in person, attended by his business agent to attend to his own interests. The sale had been advertised largely for many weeks, so the name of Mr. Butler was not mentioned, and as the Negroes were known to be a choice lot and very desirable property, the attendance of buyers was large. I'm talking about human beings. The breaking up of an old family estate is so uncommon an occurrence that the affair was regarded with unusual interest throughout the South. For several days before the sale, every hotel in Savannah was crowded with Negro speculators from North Carolina and South Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, Alabama, and Louisiana, who had been attracted hither by prospects of making good bargains. Nothing was heard for days in the bar rooms and public rooms but talk of the great sale, criticisms of the business affairs of Mr. Butler, and speculations as to the probable prices the stock would bring. The office of Joseph Bryan, Negro broker, who had the management of the sale, was thronged every day by eager inquiries of search, in search of information and by some who were anxious to buy, but were uncertain as to whether their securities would prove acceptable. They didn't know if they had enough money. Little parties are made up from the various hotels every day to visit the race course distant, some three miles from the city to look over the chattel and discuss their points and make memoranda for the guidance on the day of the sale. The buyers were generally of a rough breed, slangy, profane, and bearish, and being for the most part from the back river and swamp plantations, where the elegancies of polite life are not, perhaps, developed to their fullest extent. They were hillbillies. In fact, the humanities are sadly neglected by the petty tyrants of the rice fields that border the great dismal swamp. Their knowledge of the, the luxuries of our best society, comprehending only revolvers and kindred delicacies. <clears throat> and this is pretty extensive information about where the slaves would come from. I do want to skip ahead to the sale. They looked more uncomfortable than ever. The close confinement indoors for a number of days and the drizzly, unpleasant weather began to tell on their condition. They moved around more listlessly and were fast losing the activity and springiness they had first shown. This morning they were all gathered in the long room of the building erected as the grandstand of the race course where they might be immediately under the eyes of the buyers. The room was about a hundred feet long by twenty feet wide, and herein were crowded by the poor creatures, with much of their baggage awaiting their respective calls to step on the block and be sold to the highest bidder. This morning, Mr. Pierce Butler appeared among his people, speaking to each one, and being recognized with seeming pleasure by all. 
The men obscurely pulled off their hats and made their indescribable sliding hitch with a foot which passes with a bow, and the women dropped with a quick curtsy, which seldom vouchsafed to any other than the legitimate master and mistress. Occasionally to a very old or favored servant, Mr. Butler would send his gloved hand, which mark of condensation was immediately hailed with grins of delight from all the sable witnesses. <sighs> Give me a second. Mr. Walsh mounted the stand and announced the terms of the sale. One-third cash, the remainder repayable in two equal annual installments, being the interest from the day of sale to be secured and approved mortgage and personal security, or approved acceptances in Savannah, Georgia, or Charleston, South Carolina. Purchaser to pay for papers. The buyers who were present to the number of about 200 clustered around the platform. The Negroes who were not likely to immediately be wanted gathered into sad groups in the background to watch the process of the selling in which they were so sorrowfully interested. The wind howled outside, and through the open side of the building, the driving rain came pouring in, and the bar down the stairs ceased for a short time its brisk trade. The buyers lit fresh cigars, got ready their catalogs and pencils, and the first lot of human shadows was led upon the stand, not by a white man, but a sleek mulatto, himself a slave, who seems to regard the selling of his brethren, which he so glibly assists as a capital joke. It had been announced that the Negroes would be sold in families. That is to say, a man would not be parted from his wife or a mother from a very young child. There is perhaps as much policy as humanity in this arrangement, for thereby many aged and unserviceable people are disposed of who might otherwise not find a ready sale. Let's take a quick stop and think about that for a moment. We talk extensively about the inhumanities of slavery. Um, but look at this language that's being used. There is a degree to which I am constantly fascinated in this very dark and disgusting way by how the language implies we understand the humanity of the people who we are treating in this most inhumane way. And that we proceed to do it anyway. It's incredibly difficult to really rectify that idea that, that we did it willingly and that we understood. And that everything that comes from this, every every excuse or design is in and of itself is, is in and of itself an excuse. It is the thinnest veneer over which It's, it's much, much more... The line that separates us from doing terrible things is not nearly as black and white and distinct as we want to make it. And I think that's something to keep in mind um, as we talk about this. Particularly, I'm not going to read the rest of this. It's horrifying. You are more than welcome to read the rest of us, but I, I feel like I've gotten the point across where I want to get to. Um, the next part I want to do is there are a number of incredibly famous recordings that the Library of Congress has put forward uh, from previously enslaved people well after, well after this point. So slavery effectively ends in 1865, 63, 62 sort of in some places. Uh, the 13th Amendment is ratified in 1865, ending slavery. These collection of recordings are almost, are, are almost 70, 80 years later. I'm going to start here with this as soon as it loads up. It is long, um, 
we're probably only going to go over two of these. But again, I encourage everyone to take a look at these in order to get an understanding of what happened. Let me know if you can hear this properly. Talk to who? Well, just tell me what your name is. My name is Fountain Hughes. I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. My grandfather was 115 years old when he died. And now I am 101 years old. That's enough. She used to work. But what she made, I don't know. I never asked her. You just go ahead and talk away there. You don't mind, do you, Uncle Sam? No. And when now your husband and you yes. both are young, you all try to live like young people ought to live. Don't want everything somebody else has got. Whatever you get, it is shown. Be satisfied. And don't spend your money until you get it. So many people get in debt. Well, that always oh, it's just cheap, and I bought it. You spend your money before you get it because you're going in debt for what you want. When you want something, Wait until you get the money and pay for it cash. That's what I've done. If I wanted anything, I waited until I got the money and I paid for it cash. I never bought nothing on time in my life. Now, plenty of people, if they want a suit of clothes, they go to work and they buy them on time. Well, they said it was cheap. Did you? If you got the money, you can buy them cheaper. They want something for, for waiting on you for uh, till you get ready to pay them. And if you got the money, you can go where you choose and buy it when you go, when you want it. You see, don't buy it because somebody else go down and run a debt and run a bill, or I'm going to run it too. Don't do that. I never done it. Now I'm 100 years old and I don't owe nobody five cents, but I ain't got no money. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm happy, just as happy as somebody that oh, got a million. Nothing worries me. I'm not. My head ain't even white. Uh, nothing in the world worries me. I can sit here in this house till night. Nobody can come and say, Mr. Hughes, you owe me a quarter, owe me a dollar, you owe me five cents. No, you can't. I don't owe you nothing. Why? I never made no bills in my life. And I'm living too. And I'm a hundred years old. And if you take my advice today, you'll never make a bill. Of course, what you want, give me money, pay them cash. And then the rest of the money is yours. But when you're on the bill, they, well, so much and so much, and you don't have to pay it's nothing down. It's all, and when you come to pay, it's all, you don't have to pay no more. But they, they'll, they'll charge you more. They're getting something of it, else they wouldn't trust you. But I can't just say what they're getting. But they're getting something of it, else they wouldn't want your credit. Now, I tell you that. Anybody that trusts you for two dollars or have a... It also probably has to be said that Mr. Hughes would have found it difficult to secure large-scale credit as a black man throughout much of this period. Count with them by the month or by the week, store count or any count, they are getting something out of it. They'll say they don't want to accommodate you that much to trust you. Now, if I want, of course I ain't got no clothes, but if I want some clothes, I'll I uh, ain't got no money. I'm gonna wait till I get the money to buy them. Indeed I am. I'm not gonna say, of course, I can get them on the trust. I go down and get them. I gotta pay a dollar more anyhow. They'll either charge them more if they say taxes or so much. But if I got the money to pay cash up, I pay the taxes and all down cash, then it's all done with. So many of colored people is head over heels in debt. Trust me, trust me. I get it on time. They want a set of furniture. Go down and pay down so much and rest on time. You done paid, done paid for them then. When you pay down so much, you may charge you $50 for $100 for a set, and you pay down $25 cash, you done paid for them. Mm. That's all it was worth, $25. And you pay, now I'm $75 in debt now. Because I have to pay $100, that's it. And it's only worth about $25. But you mind on time. But people ain't got sense enough to know it. 
But when you get old like I am, you will come and you think, well, I have done wrong. I should have kept my money until I wanted this thing, and when I wanted, I take my money and go cash, cash for it. Else I you will do without it. Yes. Suppose you want a new dress. You say, well, I I buy it, but uh, I don't need it. But I can get it on time. Well, let's go down to the store today and get something on time. Well, you go down and get a dress on time, something else, and that will, yeah, I want that to sell that to you on time. You don't have to pay nothing down. But there's a pay down. Seriously, this is why field work is exhausting. Um, we are five minutes in and we have not gotten to the thing. And I have this natural impatience that I want to just do the thing. What are you doing? Okay, I'm going to leave this running. We're going to keep going. I've listened to it. I'll come back and talk about it, but I'm taking the dog out. They're coming. And when the payday comes, they want you to come pay them. If you don't, they can't get no more. Well, if you never do that, if you don't start it, you will never end it. I never did buy nothing on time. I must tell you on this... I'm sitting right here now today, and if it's the last word I've got to tell you, I never even much as try to buy a shirt on time. And plenty of people go to work, down to the store and buy uh, three and four dollars for a shirt, two, three, uh, seven, eight dollars for a pair of pants. Of course, they get them on time. I don't know, no, no. I say, I've got, I, I buy something for five dollars. Of course, I got the five dollars. I pay for it. I'm done with that. You talk about how old you are, Uncle Found you. Well, how far back do you remember? I remember. Well, I tell you, uh, things come to me in spirits, you know. I remember things uh, more when I'm laying down than I do when I'm standing, when I'm walking around. Mm -hmm. Now, in my boy days, well, yeah. Uh, Boys live quite different from the way they live now. But boys wouldn't as mean as they are now either. Boys live to, and they were always satisfied. They never wore no shoes until they were 12 or 13 years old. And now people put on shoes on babies, you know, when they're too young, when they're much older, I'd be young and old. Put shoes on babies, just as soon as you see them out in the street, they got shoes on. I told a woman the other day, I said, I never had no shoes until I was 13 years old. She said, well, right, but you bruise your feet all up and stump your toes. I said, yes, many times I've stumped my toes and the blood run out of them. That didn't make me buy me no shoes. And I've been, oh, oh you wore a dress like a woman till I was, I believe, 10, 12, 13 years old. So you wore a dress, though? Yes, I didn't wear no pants, and of course, it didn't make boys pants. Boys wore dresses. No, the women's wearing the dresses, and the boys are going with the... Uh, when the women's wearing the pants now, and the boys are wearing the dresses. Still. <laughs> Who did you work for, Uncle Fallon? When... Who did I work for? Yeah. When I, you mean when I was a slave? Yeah, when you were a slave. Who did you work for? Well, I belonged to um, uh, Burnley's when I was a slave. My mother belonged to Burnley's when my... Uh, but uh, we uh, was all slave children, and soon after, when we found out that we were free, well, then we were uh, bound out to different people, Ficklin, Andrew, and Andrews, and all such people that, and we had run away and wouldn't stay with them. Well, then we'd just go and stay anywhere we could, lay out at night and anywhere. We had no home, you know. We just turned out like a lot of cattle. You know how to turn the cattle out in the pasture? But after freedom, you know, colored people didn't have nothing. Colored people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. They want to slip on the floor. Cut it here, cut it there. Just like a lot of uh, wild people. We didn't, we didn't know nothing. Didn't like to look at no book. And there were some freeborn colored people where they had a little education, but there were very few of them where we was. And we all had a, what you call, I might call it now, 
Oh, uh, jail sentence. Mm -hmm. Just same as we were in jail. Now, I couldn't go from here across the street. Well, I couldn't go to nobody's house that I have a note or something from my master. And if I had that pass, I don't want to call a pass. If I had that pass, I could go wherever he sent me, and I'd have to be back. You know, when I, whoever he sent me to, they, they'd give me another pass, and I'd bring that back, so it's to show how long I'd been gone. We couldn't go and stay an hour or two hours or something. they just send you. No, say for instance, I'd go over to the Shirley's place, I'd have to walk. And I'd have to be back maybe in an hour, maybe they'd give me an hour, I don't know just how long they'd give me. But they'd give me a note so there wouldn't nobody interfere with me and tell who I belonged to. And when I come back, why well, I'd carry it to my master and give that to him, that'd be all right. But I couldn't just walk away like the people does now, you know. You thought to call we were slaves, we belonged to people. They sell us like they sell horses and cows and hogs and all like that, have an auction bench and they put you on, up on the bench and bid on you, the same as you're bidding on cattle, you know. Was that in Charlotte that you were a slave? Hmm? Was that in Charlotte or Charlottesville? That was in Charlottesville. Charlottesville, Virginia. They sell women, sell men. Oh, they and then if they had any bad ones, they'd sell them to the nigger traders, what they call the nigger traders, and they'd ship them down south. They'd sell them down south. But uh, otherwise, if you were a good, good person, they wouldn't sell you. But if you were bad and mean, they didn't want to beat you and knock you around, they'd sell you to the what they call the nigger traders. They'd have a regular, have a sale every month, you know, at the courthouse. And, then you'd sell you, maybe two hundred dollars, hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. Were you ever sold from one person to another? Hmm? Were you ever sold? No, I never was sold. You always stayed with the same, all, all same person. Was, I was too young to sell. Oh, I see. See, I wasn't old enough during the war to sell, during the army, and uh, my father got killed in the army, you know. So it left us small children just to live on. Whatever people choose to give us. I will I will bind out for a dollar a month. And my mother used to collect the money. Children would couldn't spend money when I come along. And, and in fact, when I come along young men young men couldn't spend no money until they're twenty one years old. And then you're twenty one, well then you could spend your money. But if you wasn't twenty one you couldn't spend no money. I couldn't take I couldn't spend 10 cents if somebody gave it to me. Because they'd think, well, you might have stole it. We all come along, you might say, we had to give an account of what you done. You, you couldn't just do things and walk off and say, I didn't do it. You'd have to give an account of it. Now, uh, after we got freed and it turned us out like cattle, we, could, we didn't have nowhere to go. I'm back. We didn't have nobody to boss us, and uh, we didn't know nothing. There wasn't, wasn't no school, and when they started the little school, well, people that were slaves, they couldn't many of them go to school, except they had a father and mother, and my father was dead, and my mother was living, but she had three, four other little children, she had to put them all to work for, to help take care of the others. So we had, well, we had what you call worse than dogs that got it now. The dogs that got it now are better than we had it when we come along. I know, I remember one night I was out after I was free and I didn't have nowhere to go. I didn't have nowhere to sleep. I didn't know what to do. My brother and I was together. So we knew a man that had a, a living stable there. And we crept in that yard and got in one of the hacks of the automobile and slept in that hack all night long. So next morning, we could get out and go where we belong. But we were afraid to go at night because we didn't know where to go. We didn't know what time to go. But we had got away from there and we were afraid to go back. So we kept in slipping that thing all night until the next morning and we got back where we belong before the people got up. Soon the day commenced to come out and break. We 
Thought I wouldn't come in school forever long. But we never done that but the one time. After that, we always the way we try to get back before night come. But then that was on a Sunday too that we done that. Now, uh, when we were slaves, we couldn't do that. See, mm -hmm. and if we got free, we didn't know nothing to do. And my mother, she then she hunted places and bound us out for about a month. And we stayed there maybe a couple of years. And She'd come over and collect the money every month. And a dollar was worth more then and ten dollars is now. And I, and the men used to work for ten dollars a month, hundred and twenty dollars a year, used to hire that way. Uh, now you can't get a man for fifty dollars a month. You pay a man now fifty dollars a month, you don't want to work for it. More like fifty dollars a week nowadays. <laughs> That's just it exactly. You want fifty dollars a week, and they ain't got no more now. And we had then, and we no more money. But of course, they bought more stuff, and more property, and all like that. We didn't have no property. We didn't have no home. We had nowhere, nothing. We didn't have nothing. No, no. Just to light your cattle, just turned out, and uh, get along the best you could. Nobody to look after so well. Been slaves all our lives. My mother was a slave. My sisters were slave. Father was a slave. Who was your father a slave for, Longfellow? He's a slave for Burnley. He, he, belonged, he belonged to Burnley. Didn't he belong to Thomas Jefferson at one time? He or? didn't belong to Thomas Jefferson. He my did. grandfather belonged to Thomas. Oh, Jefferson. your grandfather did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father belonged to uh, Burnley. And uh, Burnley died during the war time because uh, he was afraid he'd have to go to war. But uh, now, you, and in them days, you could hire a substitute to take your place. Well, he couldn't get a substitute to take his place, so he ran away from home. And he took hold. And when he come back, the war was over, but he died. And then, uh, if he had lived, it couldn't have been no good. The Yankees just come along and just broke the mill open, rolled all the flour out in the river, and broke the, broke the store open, and sold all the meat out in the street, sold all the sugar out. And we, we boys would pick it up and carry it, and give it to our mill missus and master, young master, until we come to be. Well, I don't know how, I don't know, tell you the truth. When I think of it today, I don't know how I'm living. None of the rest of them is I know is living. I'm the oldest one that I know is living. But still, I'm thankful to the Lord. Now, if uh, if my master wanted to send me, he never said you couldn't get a horse and ride and walk. You, you know, and walk. You'd be barefooted. Cold, but didn't make no difference. He wasn't no more than a dog, some of them in them days. He wasn't treated as good as he treat dogs now. But still, I didn't like to talk about it because it makes, makes people. I want you to be clear that that sentence was they were treated as good as we treat dogs now. I feel bad. Uh, I, I could say a whole lot I don't like to say. I won't say a whole lot no. Do you remember much about the Civil War? No, I don't remember much about it. You're a little young then, I guess. Huh? Uh, yeah. I remember when the Yankees came along and took all the good horses and took all the, sort of all the meat and flour and sugar and stuff out in the river and let it go down the river. And they know the people that wouldn't have nothing to live on, but they don't have them. That's the reason why I don't like to talk about it. And people, and if you was cooking anything, eating that for yourself, and if they, if they was hungry, they'd go and eat it all up, you wouldn't even get nothing. They'd just come in and drink up all your milk, milk, and just do as you please. In time to be passing by all night long, walking, mud, raining, all oh, they ever come to. Colored people is free, you ought to be awful thankful. And some of them are sorry they are free now. Some of them now would rather be slaves. Mm. What did you rather be, Uncle Fallon? Me? 
What's that about the people? <laughs> you know what I'd rather do? If I thought, had any idea, that I'd ever be a slave again, I'd take a gun and just end it all right away. Because you know. Yeah, I had definitely had to, uh, uh, definitely, most definitely had to pre-screen these. Um, let's sit with that for a second. Um, he, over 70 years later, is so absolutely disinclined to have to go through that process again, to be enslaved again, that he would enact upon himself the ending of TOS sucks. He would enact upon himself the ending of his own life. This, this is the reality of what people are talking about and saying. And I'm going to go to another recording for a little bit, uh, because we got to the crux of what I wanted to talk about here. This is the reality of, uh, uh, of what stories we can tell about the system of American enslavement. And I'm going to point out what these narrative is trying to be wielded by this document when we get to it um again this is a very heavy evening this is not the right one Oh, this is the right one. Never mind. Excuse me. This is a very heavy evening. Yeah, that one is not coming out well today. These are these are bad recordings in so far as recording quality goes. Yeah, this is not helping. I am not hearing this nearly as well on this device as I was the other. Let's try this. It's uh, a little bit newer. Well, you said you stay all okay. can't go on. Tell me about them coming through here with cannons. Yeah, yeah. Now I'll tell you what's thing. Way back in slavery time, I was standing at that when the nigga were free. How we all got every day back in town to see the Yankees all going back home. I can really disagree that this house, this house, uh, six and, and eight wheels to a cannon going through, and boats on them, uh, cannon, cannon, then they put the wagon and have boats all on them wagons. Oh, welcome to the mule, welcome to the mule, and one man, a riding, riding a tongue mule, we all just take a look at him. I'm saying, all day long I'll be caught, and I'll be just well, and all the Yankees I'll be like with blue, were dressed in blue clothes. I can remember, we blue jump right here, and had a little pillow on the coat back there, back on, and course it up here. You, yeah. I'll be just as well, did you come out, and it, black mules, just have uh, maybe, oh, I don't know how many black horses, then they come along in with a lot of these old gray mules on it. It's to them cannon, cannon up. And then they come back with horses, saw horses. All he took all going through the that lived for two days. They were going out through the for two days. And I remember and the Yankees stopped here. And the Yankees stopped back on the corner I said, well, I was a good side boys then. And then what they call Freedom Bureau, we you hear tell that anything. And they prosecuting people you know what to do, you know, and all like that. And I read that hard as I've seen two men that had that were punishing 
well, what they do, and I seem to tick them. At, uh, at a little big tent, we, we go to go out and see them, and they take them, hang them up with a stone. And they let the tip, let that family hang out so many men, they let him down. That's the punishment they got. I regret the old man that had not come an old Deb, uh, Shelley. His name is Yankee White. And the man, the judge's name, I forgot his name. But then I know he was like Yankee White. And that's what he used to do in something. But then they come, and my old master, old Colonel Cray, he bought one, two of the horses from him. I regret I rode the horse a many times. One old big horse they called Yankee Tom, big sorrow horse. And another big old horse was a saddle horse old Colonel McCray bought, and he was called Boston. He was a good big black horse. I used to get on him, he took them all down to a farm, and I used to go all of that. I was a good big boy then. And a good big boy. And the Yankees had come, and after a while, there'd be a whole troop of men come. They said they were Yankees. All walking. All walking. That crew of Yankees would go soon. Next time you see, there come a whole troop of Yankees. All riding horses. Big. Guns hanging on there, and all like that, you know. Yeah. You all just stand looking at them, all going home. And I said, I asked him, I said, I said, to him, I said Mama, what are, where are they going? He said, they're all going home now. And old Colonel Creed out on the monster, he was looking at He said, well, hi, all of you niggas is all free now. Yankees all going home. I remember that dish as well. Right, right in town. So what we did in that, right above the new, the new, uh, Post office. That's my old, old master's home. That's the uh, 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 old post office. But that is his square from that post office came down to the citizen bank. All that is his whole square now. And came over to the other part, come out on the street the Methodist Church. That's my old master's state. I can remember he was a speculator. I can remember a good big boy there. He had a big old shed there. And, and it had cotton all in that shed, and we boys all were playing on that shed every day. And it had, a, it had wagon, they were, every day he'd load up all them wagons and take all that cotton and go. Oh, now you see, that, that was a slavery time. Now we get this as well, and he'd bring back a whole lot of colored people. Oh, come and crazy, they said he was a speculator. And he sell them to all these people around this country. There's a lot of old people all dead now, but he brought them so They all go off and bring them in. Oh, you look all of that. My old, my old, my old papa was his wagon up. I used to go, he used to carry me with him all the time. He used to haul cotton, tear cotton from Jasper to Wise's Blue. And, and carry from Wise's Blue, and they carry cotton over him. The Wilkes at a place they call, uh, I've got the place now, Cat Cotton Anyway. I remember he used to, he used to all the words, I was a good big boy now, and he had an auction, had an old, had an auction, had an old auction named Brandy. That's how come he used his wagon. He'd get tired and sit down, Bill, oh, yes sir, get on up, get this foot, get on. And I'd ride old Brandy, ride old Brandy and drive the rest of them, right here. So I get tired and get down and walk side on that. I'll be like, oh, only got been to a heap. <laughs> All that stuff. That, that is a shame time. That is a shame time. And I remember I can take them over a shame time. Right down, I can't tell you that's how I can. Right down close to Mr. Uh, Leaky May's place, there was an old jailhouse now. Old long jailhouse. Old old jailhouses now. That that's only that's all I get that that's where and it was no was no court was no old some kind of old courthouse, I reject it. And used to put prisoners in that jailhouse. And me, me and another young white fellow really named Coley McCray and Henry Mon. And we used to go home, the people that want some tea, we used to go home and steal bread and stuff and poke a little bar to the prisoners. Boy, that's like San Jacko, and there's no log jailhouse. Yeah. And all around now we're, we're great. And I rigged up one time, we all was looking at it, and they, and they brought in, they had hounds. 
And he brought them hard in and brought three niggers. With them hard runaway niggers, you know, cutting wood. And they, right, right across, right the creek there, they take them niggers and put them on, and put them on a log laying down the pavement. And hook them. Yeah, them niggers hollering and praying on that log. And there was a man to bring them in. Then they take them out down and put them in jail. I don't know what that. No, I see all of that out of oh, the All right, yes, that was painfully difficult to understand. Uh, before before we move on to the next part, uh, I grabbed one of my old readers from my undergrad work. So when you take an American history course, or really any history course in college, if you haven't, what's usually going to be provided to you, or rather required that you purchase, is a textbook and a... Uh, uh, a reader which will contain excerpts from primary source documents. So this is one of those readers actually that I would have had, you know, quite some time ago. This particular writing is from someone who interviewed Nat Turner, who is a relatively famous person who, a uh, slave preacher actually, who turned around and instituted an insurrection against their enslavement in the 1830s. So I'm just going to read a little passage from this right here before we move on to the meat of this here and really get into it. Sir, you have asked me to give a history of the motives which induced me to undertake the late insurrection, as you call it. To do so, I must go back to the days of my infancy and even before I was born. I was 31 years of age, the 2nd of October last, and born to the property of Benjamin Turner of this country. In my childhood, a circumstance occurred which made an indelible impression on my mind and laid the groundwork of that enthusiasm which has terminated so fatally to many both black and white and black, and for which I am about to atone at the gallows. It is here necessary to relate the circumstances, trifling as it may seem, it was the commencement of that belief, which has grown with time, and even now, sir, in this dungeon, helpless and forsaken as I am, I cannot divest myself of. Being at play with other children, when three or four years old, I was telling them something which my mother overhearing said it had happened before I was born. I stuck to my story, however, and related some things which went, in her opinion, to confirm it. Others being called on were greatly astonished, knowing that these things had happened, and caused them to say in my hearing that I would surely be a prophet, as the Lord had shown me things that had happened before my birth. And my father and mother strengthened me in this my first impression, saying in my presence I was intended for some great purpose, which they had always thought from certain marks on my head and breast. This is quite long, actually. Since the commencement of 1830, I've skipped quite a far ahead. Since the commencement of 1830, I've been living with Mr. Joseph Travis, who was to me a kind master and placed the greatest confidence in me. In fact, I had no cause to complain of his treatment of me. On Saturday evening, the 20th of August, it was agreed between Henry, Hark, and myself to prepare a dinner for the next day for the men as we expected them. Uh to concert a plan, and we had not yet determined on any. Hark on the following morning brought a pig, and Henry Brandy, being joined by Sam, Nelson, Will, and Jack, prepared in the woods a dinner, where about three o'clock I joined them. I saluted them on coming up, and asked Will how came he to be there, and answered that his life was worth no more than the others, and his liberty is dear to him. I asked if he thought uh, him if he thought to obtain it. He said he would or lose his life, and this was enough to put in him full confidence. Jack, I knew, was only a tool in the hands of Hark, and it was quickly agreed that we should commence at home, Mr. Travis's, on that night until we had armed and equipped ourselves and gathered sufficient force, neither age nor sex was to be spared, which invari was invariably adhered to. We remained at the feast until about two hours into the night. I went to the house and found Austin, 
and they all went to the cider press and drank, except myself. On returning to the house, Hark went to the door with an axe for the purpose of breaking it open, as we knew we were strong enough to murder the family if they were awakened by the noise. But reflecting that it might create an alarm in the neighborhood, we determined to enter the house secretly and murder them while sleeping. Hark got a ladder and set it against the chimney, on which I ascended and hoisting a window, entered in and came down. Stairs, unbarred the door and removed the guns from their places, and it was... Then I observed that I must spill the first blood, on which, armed with a hatchet and accompanied by will, I entered my master's chamber. It being dark, I could not give a death blow, and the hatchet glanced from his head. He sprang from the bed and called his wife. It was his last word. Will laid him dead with a blow of the axe, and Miss Travis shared the same fate as she lay in bed. So, I bring that up not to justify any of the violence against black people that slavery entailed. But it illustrates that no matter what advantage you might think you have had in bondage, people desire to be free of bondage. They do not submit to it. Um, the first interviewer made a comment that he thinks that some people would willingly be slaves in their condition now. I don't think he believes that, the truth. I think it's easy to be disparaging. But this, this brings us to, this brings us to what we are looking at tonight. Um, it actually happens quite quickly. These are the Florida guidelines for history going forward. I have some problems, and there's there was a very good Twitter thread going over the problems previously. I will uh, go over that after this, um, but we're going to go over some of these, and I'm going to talk about structure and how we present history and historiography, and how that influences how we see events. And as we're doing this, I want you to keep in mind what we have just listened to and talked about for the past hour or so. Um, and ask yourself, what is being emphasized here in these standards and what is being emphasized in these accounts? And see if there's an incongruency. The first set of objectives is examine the condition of slavery as it existed in Africa, Asia, and the Americas in Europe prior to 1619. 1619 being the particular date of contention in the 1619 project. Instruction includes how trading slaves developed in African lands. Um, in and of itself, the trading of slaves in African lands is not necessarily unique enough to warrant what they're doing. So, Europeans set up throughout the course of the 1600s, mostly Portuguese, colonies along the coast of Africa. They can't penetrate the interior because they don't have malaria drugs yet. So, while it is true that slavery as a practice does not take place in the Caribbean, in Europe, and in America in this fashion without the assistance of local populations. This does not excuse this fact. And you'll notice, for example, when we went over the history legends video, that they tried to present this as an exculpatory factor in that if the local population is included in the action it cannot be wrong and that's simply not the case slavery is a worldwide practice to this day practiced all over the world in some very insidious forms the second emphasis they're going to place is on the barbary pirates who are an effective offshoot arm of the ottoman empire placing slavery in a 
a context of Muslim countries, the Muslim slave market is not pertinent to the instruction of African of Amer African American history. <sighs> instruction how slavery is utilized in Asian culture. This objective, you start to see this, is twofold. It is both designed to take the onus of slavery individually away from a single culture. And it, point out that it has happened worldwide. And it is correct to say that slavery has happened and continues to happen worldwide. It is not correct, though, to de-emphasize the uniquely cruel nature in which the slavery utilized. Uh, slave trade created in the Middle Passage destroys, absolutely destroys those subjected to it. Instruction now, slavery among indigenous peoples in the Americas was used like, these are huge, huge topics in and of themselves. The next indentured servitude contracts don't exist between black Africans in early Jamestown, Virginia. At least not any significant amount. And notice where this is placed. This is placed in African American history. <clears throat> the discussion of indentured servitude being compared to slavery is a very common tactic designed to excuse slavery in that it seems less severe placed next to indentured servitude. And that's just simply not the case. Uh, we talked about this kind of extensively when I went over that one uh, Mr. Terry video. This particular clarification here, as they talk about the triangle trade, is really disgusting. Instruction includes what made indentured servitude contracts a risky investment for colonists based on economic and social factors. If this needs to be its own section and not tied into slavery, because when you put it here like this, it justifies slavery in a, an economic sense. Because indentured servitude is uh, not slavery. They are distinct institutions. Uh, this section's not bad. This section, again, is is very badly placed. Explain the significance of England sending convicts, vagabonds, and children to the colonies. Uh, it's not terribly significant in this context of slavery. Like, again, this is designed to contrast these practices and draw equivalencies between slavery and the economic practices and ex exploitation of the rich of the poor. These are not the same things. There's a very distinct state of being which comes with being enslaved that is not the same as being poor. And to try to flatten the curve between these things is disingenuous. And here's the, here's the kicker of it. This is not necessarily inaccurate information but the presentation of information how information is put forward to you matters immensely because that presentation can soften certain information and harden others and create a false impression that justifies acts in the past and we can explore acts the past without justifying it This is, again, it's important to know that slavery is radically different in different parts of the world. Slavery in the Caribbean, because it's sugar, 
growing and processing consumes slaves. Sugarcane is dangerous. Boiling it is dangerous. The slaves that were sent to the Caribbean would die. And the slaves sent to North America are not necessarily in as much danger as those sent to the Caribbean or South America. So the slave trade in North America becomes largely self-sustaining because slaves can have children who are the, and in turn enslaved. So a new generation of enslaved people is born. So 20 years after the Constitution is ratified, the states take the option, overpower the South, and make illegal the importation of new slaves. To a certain extent, this works. There is some black market importation of slaves from Africa. But by and large, at this point, the slave trade is over because slavery in and of itself is self-sustaining in the South. Evening, Titan. Slavery at this point is self-sustaining in the South. So the effective end of the slave trade comes around 1818, 1819. The, um, the actual, or the end of the international slave trade, the actual slave trade continues on, though, because you have this system which just propagates itself over and over and over again. This comparison, again, is not pertinent to American history. This part's all right. They explicitly are excluding Nat Turner's slave rebellion, which I think is disingenuous. Florida is kind of a different case. Uh, Florida has a, a significant amount of overlap in native history, native indigenous history, and escaped slaves. You have a tribe, uh, the Seminoles there, who take in escaped slaves and integrate them into society, uh, which results in the Seminoles being, uh, what's the uh, best word? Brutally slaughtered and sent to Oklahoma. Uprooted, because in this they create a threat to the system of slavery. <sighs> yeah, Titan, they, they banned it. I, I, I might have misspoke. I, I might get my ears wrong because I'm tired. Uh, yes, they banned it. But again, like it was self-sustaining at that point. Playing how slave, code, slave codes are, are regularly strengthened at any point during this time. Um, whenever there's an uprising or just in response to abolitionists as well. And, and the uprising of Haiti scared the absolute shit out of Virginians and South Carolinans and North Carolinans. Um, quite rightly, I would imagine. The problem with federal laws, like a significant portion of the history of the United States is a conflict, at least a political history, prior to the Civil War, is a conflict between states where slavery is not allowed and states where slavery is allowed. And it's very important to stress that in the North is where these states where slavery is not allowed, it typically takes in place. And they are not, they are not doing this out of a belief in racial equality or out of benevolence. They are trying to counter the political power that the block of slave states holds in Congress and by and large in the White House. The first seven, seven of eight first presidents 
are from Virginia, and this is collectively referred to as the Virginian, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Shit. Dynasty, that's it. I swear, I, I know what I'm doing. The Virginia Dynasty. Like, so, one of the things to keep in mind about the history, and this is really important when talking about early American history, is the manner in which the Constitution is set up. It gives a... a a population advantage to slave states in the form of the three-fifths compromise. And, like, this is presented and contemporary uh, history as a kind of crutch for states like Georgia, who at this point, are, when the Constitution is being ratified, are very low population states. However, Virginia is also a slave state and can also take advantage of the three-fifths compromise in the census and is one of the more populous states, populated states in the Union, uh, apart from New York at the time. So Virginia gains an inordinate amount of immediate political power, both in the House of Representatives and in the presidency. And this gives them the ability to work with the other slave states to consolidate their power. and helps set the tone for American history going forward. The Articles of Confederation is not in effect long enough to have a significant impact on this discussion. <clears throat> so with that, we start to come, this is broad stuff, but like some people have gone in the nitty gritty of it. And I'm going to go over a thread in Twitter. And the writers of this document have taken pains to try to include examples of their principal claim of the beneficence of slavery by highlighting a number of black Americans who they say benefited from training they received as slaves. Um, to start this is a statement from the individuals who wrote it who I will point out are not historians and in fact are lawyers any attempt to reduce slaves to just victims of oppression fails to recognize their strength courage and resiliency during a difficult time in American history but the initial question I have to ask is not, well, were they strong and resilient? The more important question is, why are they strong and resilient? Why? And the answer is, they were forced upon it to do so. Uh, none of the individuals, well, not none of the individuals who are, are slaves, and I'm looking for it and why I can't see it here. Here we go. The first, his name is Ned Cobb, who is listed as a blacksmith. Ned Cobb was a tenant farmer and activist born in 1885, 20 years prior. Henry Blair, there's no evidence he was ever enslaved. In fact, he registered patents, which wouldn't be allowed. Louis Latimer, also listed as a blacksmith. A lot of blacksmiths. Louis was born a free man in Massachusetts. John Henry uh, is kind of a mythical figure. Very difficult to get information about. Uh, James Fortin, born a free African-American and was a sailmaker, not a shoemaker, as cited. 
Paul Cuff was a whaler, also born free. Betty Washington Lewis listed as a shoemaker. She's actually white and the sister of George Washington and a slave owner. Jupiter Hammond. He actually was a slave, but was a writer and a poet. And not and not a fishing and shipping worker. John Chavez, fishing and shipping industry. He was born free and was a minister. William Whipper, again, fisher. He was born in Pennsylvania, was free at birth, businessman. Crispus Attux, who is was a slave, became a sailor, but was born as a cattleman. Elizabeth Keck listed as a seamstress. She was a slave, learned how to be a seamstress as a slave. But she was taught by this by her mother while she was raped. James Thomas listed as a tailor. He was had his freedom bought by his mother. Marietta Carter listed as a tailor. Uh, there is actually no record of whoever this is. Betsy Stockton is a teacher. Yeah, she became a teacher after she was a freed person. And Booker T. Washington taught himself to read and not actually not taught this task because it's part of his enslavement. Uh, so we have nine people who were s never enslaved, nine who are listed in the raw industry. Uh, next to none of them learn their skills while being enslaved. One doesn't exist, and one is the white sister of George Washington. This is a curriculum that is designed to deceive students by presenting them both false information and presenting correct information in misapplied ways. It is not done correctly. It cannot be considered a valid system by which one can be uh, educated. It cannot be considered a, a biased, unbiased account in any means, and it cannot be coincidental that this has been constructed in this way. This is a deliberate attempt to obfuscate the history of American slavery in order to avoid reckoning with the realities of American slavery. This is difficult subject matter. But it's critical to why me and Hetman have started this endeavor. To talk about the places in which the inadequate teaching of history is harming people. It's, uh, it is, it is core to what we are trying to do here. Um, this is what I have for you tonight. It's heavy. It's what I'm going to leave you with tonight. What I would like to know, either in the comments or in chat before, as I close out, because I will be putting this into, you know, sleep mode quick. Uh, what I'd like to know is if you want to see more streams where we talk about the kind of primary source work we have done here. Because I'm not going to lie, this is time-consuming to prepare. I wanted to do this days ago, and I spent a whole lot of time going through these sources and making sure, A, they're appropriate for YouTube's terms of service for me to put up, and B, um, illustrated the point that needs to be made about the issue at hand. So it's not a small amount of work. So I immensely appreciate our patrons so far. And you can find the Patreon in 
the description box down below. Um, along with a posted tip link if you feel that I need to help out a little. Um, because this is this is work that would be immensely aided by my ability to access more information. So the Patreon helps and uh, Palm Dad and, and uh, Vidalia, we are immensely grateful to you. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that helps is tips and then sharing the stream, subscribing, liking, all these things are immensely important because it lets us grow and gives us more scope that we can work towards. I want to do more stuff like this, and I hope that you want me to do more stuff like this too. So uh, feel free to leave me a comment here, Discord, anywhere, if you want to see more stuff like this. And with that, I'm going to leave you tonight. I'm going to wish you all a good night and ask you to stay safe. We're probably going to be back tomorrow uh, with more heavy topics that Hetman wants to engage in. Uh, so with that, have an excellent evening, everyone.